the heads up. So the paper number two is due March 17th, Thursday. Here is the paper rubric. Here is the speaking rubric. So um, the day we have class after it's due, which would be Tuesday because spring break starts and you don't have class. Well, I mean, let's see. So the day of class, yeah, it won't be, you won't present it in class until much later, but the 29th will be our next class after once spring break starts. So then you have to sort of formally present. Here are the paper topics. You're required to meet with me for a conference. Um, and if you have any other questions, you do you have any questions, Jack or Melanie? No. Oh. Can okay. you do it for Confucianism? What? Is uh, Confucianism one of the topics? No, it's not. The focus of the second one is the political virtues. Okay. Um, and the reason I emphasize that is our Kansans do not get raised to care about the political virtues, as far as I know, <laughs> um, because they, you know, they emphasize rugged individualism. In general, they, you know, they hate the government. Well, you have to think about well, what is the government, right? So I do want you to think about that. I want you to write about that. Okay. All right. So I do. I did put. Uh, the Confucius paper topics over here, I think, um, or I can. And the reason is that if you want to finish your third paper early, really early, before April hits, you can do that. I guess I will put, I will attach those paper topics here, um, Tuesday's class. But the third paper is on Confucius or Hinduism or Buddhism. And it's true that you might write on Confucius and then wish you had waited, but I just want to give you a chance so that you can, toward the end of the semester, you can plan ahead, get stuff done, and not have a crunch time. That's the goal. All right. So let's do Confucius. Jack. What was your impression when you read Confucius? I thought he was more um, like Arist or, um, Socrates, but like he was more emphasizing social togetherness, like social cohesion and traditions. I don't know if I like that as much, but I feel like he stressed that more. Yeah, he did, right? And that's the stereotype about China, right? Yeah. Is it? I, I feel like I saw a lot of um, like modern day things in China that go back to this. Right. Just like you read John Locke, you read our founders, not the their views on religion, but their views on minimal government. And then, you know, even though the world has changed a lot, Americans will still go back to that, you know, keep the government out of my life. So it is, it's important that you know these traditions just hang on and hang on. And that's what students absorb by habit and custom without even thinking about it. But that's why I like teaching college. We get, you have to rip yourself away from that and look at what you're taught in light of the world that we have now, right? So you can adapt. Um, so I do think you need to know the intellectual past in order to deal with the present, but you shouldn't idealize the past or demonize the past, right? The present isn't always better and it isn't always worse, <laughs> which sounds like common sense, but I just think Oftentimes, people will talk about the good old days. Have you ever, ever heard anybody talking about the good old days, Jack? Yeah. What 
what's good about them. Yeah, like the 1960s. The 60s are the good. Okay, so I know some people, the 50s are the good old days. So what's good about the 60s? I don't know. It was like a break from like all the rules, like the hippie movement. All right, because, you know, uh, my idea of the 60s is when America had to decide if they're going to try to be an empire or if they're going to try to be fair and have a democratic, you know, have a lot of balance of powers. And the Vietnam War was saying, no, we want an empire. So it is interesting, though, you know, what people thought about what the 60s is or was, just like what they thought about what the founders are or were. We get told these stories. So um, it's important <laughs> that you, that you, you know, say, well, maybe there was more to it than that. Maybe there were other things going on. Um, what about you, Melanie? Uh, well, I thought um, Confucius seemed more of a humanist to me, like more of his morals were humanist. Um, but I thought it was interesting that after Confucius's death, um, he kind of underwent like glorification um where they say he's the sun the moon which there's no way of climbing over and I, I just thought it was interesting that he kind of practiced more humanism but then confucianism turned into a religion and those two are supposed to be separate i, don't, I just thought that was interesting very good melanie that's what happened with jesus right Jesus, yes. Yeah. Okay. Same thing. It gets institutionalized. People tell the stories about these guys and they have their own agendas when they're telling the stories and they want to institutionalize something. They want to put it in a box and virtue can never be put in a box. Um, but the same thing happened with Socrates, Plato scholars, you would not believe. They try to put him in a box. Um, so we have Jesus, Socrates, Aristotle is used to justify Western, privileged Western white guys, you know. So yeah, and we're going to see this again and again. So Confucius, Buddha, um, even Martin Luther King, I had a student during Black Lives Matter saying, oh, it wasn't that way during the civil rights movement. I mean, now we have all these people, they're so violent. It is not true, not true. <laughs> there was more violence during the civil rights movement. Um, so idealizing the past, is a big psychological mistake and it's a political disaster. Um, and humanist, right, Melanie? Humanist just means you have to actively exercise those virtues, right? You can't just label, you can't make yourself into a brand. <laughs> uh, does that make sense, Melanie? Yes. That's what you're getting at? Yeah, that's what I was getting at. Yeah, humanity is not a brand. It's a series of, it's a combination of feeling, thinking, and acting. That's what it is. It's not a brand. Um, all right, so let's go. Here's, here's the issue. Uh, wisdom literature is the focus, is the relation between nature and culture. And evolutionary, right? Took a long, long, long time. And over time, uh, well, first of all, we had non-living, then we had living, then we had like amoebas, really low level of functioning, then the gradual, gradual, um, the creatures reacted to their environments. Their environments got more complex. The creatures got more complex. 
the genetic mutations that were able to adapt to the new environment that was growing more complex, those were the ones that survived and it just kept going and going. Okay, so you get to humanity and then um, custom habit and imi <laughs> imitation. So why don't you give me an example? Why don't, since we only have two people, why don't you give me an example of how you think people are just acting on the basis of custom habit and imitation with no one questioning, no one being aware of choice. Hi, Alex. Um, that people are operating of a person or a society or some example of when you think it's it's unphilosophical. There's no reflective consciousness. It's just imitation and habit. All right, Jack, can you think of an example? Mm. Like manners? Maybe. Or basically like anything that you see your parents doing, you're going to imitate. When you're a kid. Yeah. OK. Um, what about political speeches? What about when it gets to things where you should be reflective? Do people vote based on habit? Yeah. Imitation? They're voting how their friends vote? Oh, yeah. It's not reflective, right? It's not, um, it's just a brand. It's what we do, <laughs> habit, custom, and imitation. Is that a very good reason? No, no matter who you vote for, it should never be, that should never be the reason. Does that make sense? Yeah. Um, all right, Any Melanie, do you have any examples? Um, I guess kind of going down the same path you were, like, when we're picking um, a political party, like Democrat or Republican, we kind of like imitate whatever that party believes in or their morals. What they say they do, because they yeah, because they took a focus group poll to see what you want to hear. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. So you have to find out if they actually do what they say they do. That's that's important too. Um, well, have you ever been in a group, any kind of social group? And the reason to do something is it's always been done that way or so-and-so does it that way. Um, or it makes me comfortable. It's my comfort zone. Do people actually say that like that's a reason? Alex, go ahead. Um, sorry, I guess one, one example I was thinking of is, uh, when people judge a character based off of, uh, like what they hear about them, not, not like from, um, what they like experience with that person. Okay. Um, because like when it becomes like a group setting, instead of confronting that person you listen to the gossip and um that's how like othering <laughs> happens or like, bullying or um just exclusion okay what i want to point out to you though is you can't have a democracy right if too many people act that way too much you'll lose your democracy does everybody understand that like, this is serious. It's not just so-and-so acting juvenile. It's, we cannot maintain a democracy unless we learn to think critically. So, so that's important. Um, but what happened with Confucius, and this is, um, China is, has a huge number of people 
and a huge level of poverty until recently. So in order to survive, people learned to just, you know, maintain frictionless social relationships because that was their survival. Um, but that's not how it started. So um, here's how it started. He, uh, Confucius lived when these um, small little fiefdoms were fighting with each other. The collapse of the Chao dynasty and there was the war, warring states. And the conquered were boiled to death and the relatives were forced to drink the soup, right? I mean, that is as just about as low as you can go. So civilization is destroyed, right? When it collapses, what are the options? All right, so when 9-11 happened, there was a shock, right? What are the options? Well, one side is to use force and to just force people to behave, right? Rewards, punishments, people are sheep, people are irrational. You just have to treat them like herd animals and you have to scare the heebie-jeebies out of them. That's the only thing that'll make them behave. Um, I, okay, so that's anti-humanist. Do you remember when we went through humanist versus anti-humanist? Anti-humanist thinks people are by nature irrational and humanists are corrupt or wrong or naive. You know, you, you, do, you can't have faith in human beings to think critically to govern themselves. Um, so what happened? Well, for a while, all of China unified. Yeah, we all have to agree. They allowed this authoritarian leader to control. But then after a generation, they get tired of that, right? <laughs> People get tired of being beat up on or threatened. Um, so the realists aren't realistic. They can't maintain that level of force for more than a generation. People start wondering why the heck does the leader have that much power, right? They don't remember that it used to be the warring states, right? That's done. We don't have to worry about that. I don't, I don't get why they have to be so powerful. All right, so the realists were too cynical. Is that, okay, let me just stop there. Does that make sense to each of you? Jack, does that make sense? Authoritarianism doesn't last. What do you think? Yeah, I don't. I don't think you can be like a like a crackdown on hard crime all the time. I don't think that's the solution. Like lock them up and throw away the key. I don't think that's the solution. Okay, the war on drugs certainly has not worked. Just cost yeah. us a lot of money. Um, what about you, Alex? I also agree with Jack uh, that to lock down and just brute force is not the way to go. Um, I mean, another example would be uh, the, any kind of revolution, like the French Revolution. Um, and uh, just when people are held down to so long, it, they a bunch of frustration builds and everything's going to topple again. Okay, that happened in the Greek city states too. There was, as soon as there's a gap between the rich and the poor, eventually the animosity. I mean, the rich will try to maintain power in any way they can. And if it's really unstable, they'll use more and more fear, right? So, what about you, Melanie? Does it make sense that realism isn't realistic? Yes, that makes sense. Okay, because there are people in our society who actually believe that. Does everybody know that? I mean, we have cynical people in our society. So you have to spot when they're, you know, 
cynically manipulating people. Um, all right. The next one was the 60s, right? All you need is love, right? Um, all we need is to get is mutual love. Now, you could use the Sermon on the Mount. Remember, Jesus said you have to forgive people seven times, 70 times. Um, and so that was their, their diagnosis was all we need is to learn to have fellow feeling, just empathy. Um, all right. If it is to regard the state of others as one's own, the houses of others as one's own, when all the people in the world love each other, uh, then we'll be fine, right? And Confucius thought that was too utopian. <laughs> all right. So what do you guys think? What about the Sermon on the Mount, right? Jesus says, forgive, don't be angry with your brother. What do you, what do you say to that? Alex? I think it would be too optimistic because when you don't withhold, when you withhold your anger or upsetness and forgive there's no learning for the other person okay all right there's also you can't make laws based on that right i mean there have to be punishments if you break the law right if you steal something you could say well nothing personal but you do have to go to jail <laughs> right so the way I figured the the Western tradition, when they united Christianity and the Greeks, the Christianity Jesus was supposed to get your heart in the right place, and then the Greeks are supposed to get your head going right. Okay, so I really want to do what's best. I don't want to take revenge. I don't want to do blah blah. But okay, okay, Jesus, I got my heart in the right place now, Aristotle. We got to do some practical wisdom here, right? Being angry for the right reason in the right way at the right time to the right person. Uh, does that make sense to, to all three of you? That's, I think, kind of the backbone of the Western tradition for many centuries. Um, Melanie, anything you want to say? Oh, I was just going to say it doesn't seem very realistic, I guess. Like there's, yeah, like you said, there's not really a way that you can run a country on that because then people think they can do whatever and they'll just be forgiven. so. Right, and that's what, I guess I had a student tell me once that there was a kid at Lion. This was long ago. Nobody you guys know, right? Used to go drinking on Saturday night and go to church on Sunday because once saved, always saved, you know, and I can drink. And if I go to church and ask for forgiveness, I'll be forgiven. <laughs> yeah, I don't think you can fool God. What do you guys think? <laughs> Definitely not. No. Time going to church. What? Probably wasting his time going to church. Well, it's just so infantile, right? It's maybe what a two-year-old might think, although I think my two-year-olds were more sophisticated than that. But I mean, it's psychologically incredibly immature. Um, all right, so, so far you agree with Confucius, right? That the realists are not realistic. The Maoists, the love everybody are not realistic. What about the United States? We, and, and we ha have talked about this, they were creating a science of uh, political life, right? A science of politics. They were doing it from scratch because this was the great enlightenment experiment. It's the most traditionless society history has ever known because it was based on principles, right? because the whole idea is we're gonna wipe the slate clean, we're gonna reject divine right of kings, we're gonna reject any sort of inherited 
power, we're going to have equality and um, freedom and people will take care of themselves. Okay, so the United States proposed reason, right? You can calculate your own interest. You can figure out how to take care of yourself, educate citizens and inform them. Remember our founders were so obsessed with education because if you don't have education, you're not gonna have democracy, right? But it was based on the belief that if we educate them, they will behave. But people didn't wanna pay taxes for education. And so we're losing our educational system. The West approach probably did not occur to Confucius. He would have dismissed it. He said the mind operates in a context of attitudes and emotions that are conditioned by relationships. Unless experiences of relationships dispose a person to cooperate, it, un upgraded reason is unlikely to do anything but aid self-interest. Okay, do we have a problem with people who are too self-interested and incapable of relationships other than with, you know, the othering, right? Other than the, this is the me and there's the other. You can't have a society like that. Does that make sense, Alex? Yes, it does. Does it make sense that Confucius would say that's because we didn't condition people to care about each other, right? We just tell people rugged individualism, pull yourself up the bootstraps. Does that make sense to you, Alex? It does. Yeah. Okay. Do you remember when education was considered a personal achievement rather than a social good? Yeah, I do. Okay. So we're going more in that direction. And the Chinese are noticing, incidentally, the reading from next time. I really want you to understand this. <laughs> There's an article, a news article, where they say seven reasons or eight reasons why China is better than America. And boy, they really get us where it hurts you guys that it's a it's a meaningful debate and i'm saying this as a philosopher right i mean we're the first ones to go in any sort of authoritarian situation so it's not like i want that to happen i'm just saying we're not doing anything to prevent it that that's my issue um what about you melanie do you think confucius had a good argument against our founders um, I mean, yeah. Can you repeat what he, what his argument was one more time? He just said, we depend on reason. And, um, if we just educate our reason and we calculate our self-interest and we, you know, respect other people, we're not going to hurt them, but you don't cultivate relationships. You don't teach people. You really need to learn how to relate to people you disagree with or people filling certain roles um, <clears throat> that you're not going to have the you're not going to have any kind of social web social fabric yes i do i agree with him um and i actually know i know some people that are in my family who are kind of like there's they're very republican very very republican and they're like well this is our side this is what we believe in and they're not even open to anything um, on the Democrat side at all. Like, it's crazy. So, yeah. <laughs> okay. What about you, Jack? Um, I kind of disagree with that point of view because, like, not everybody has to have the same viewpoints or, like, this kind of, like, central idea. Like, I think people can learn to get along with differing viewpoints like I don't think it has to be like one central idea well but he said that our founders depended upon that to be the foundation rather than to to take relationships seriously yeah. I think I like relying on reason more <laughs> you're a philosophy major not having let having less of a like I don't know I don't like this like the idea of having too much togetherness 
I think I think people should have individualism. I think that's a good thing. Okay, group think. Um, yeah. Actually, for next time, we're going to read an article where our founders actually liked Confucius Analects. Because once they set up the system based on freedom and equality, they thought outside of politics in the culture, we really need to emphasize uh, social cohesion. But not, you know, the politicians shouldn't use unity as a justification for making laws and policies, but in the social realm, it really, people really need to learn how to relate to each other. Does that make sense, Jack? Yes, ma'am. Does that make sense to you, Alex? Yes. Okay. I feel like people do have a hard time, like, especially in like this century, or I don't know, yeah. like relating to each other. Yeah. <laughs> they have a different point of view, like they just like ostracize the other person. I don't think that's healthy. Well, since 9-11, um, there, were, there were political operatives who deliberately used it to drive wedges between people. Um, that was a plan, actually. Um, anyway, so, so, and again, Houston Smith, I like his book because he's always so sympathetic toward anything we're reading. He just absolutely gives them the benefit of the doubt. So, and he's willing to, you know, accept criticism that doesn't defend his own country. So the West's approach, Confucius would disagree. So what did he do? Deliberate tradition. Tradition shapes inclinations. So he was obsessed with tradition. Um, so he set up this model of the good old days, okay? Before the warring states, he said, there was this age of great harmony during the Chao dynasty. Okay, he wasn't being hi very historically accurate. <laughs> he didn't even know basically what the data was, but he wanted this image in people's head that Chinese people are dignified, they have dignity, and they have grace, and they get along, because it wasn't what their eyes were showing them. But he'd say, yes, but there was the good old days when we really had this wonderful cohesion. So he was using it to create an image, right? To educate their imaginations, so that they would be motivated to return to that idealized past, which was, as a matter of fact, to create a better future. Um, it was the device for appropriating this glorious past. Um, all right, people understood the need. Oh, they understood the need for social order without force or without always talking about love. They just kept saying, I'm Chinese. Chinese people are dignified. Back in the Chow dynasty, you know, we were civilized. So he was a social genius. Um, and that's different from political genius. Uh, it's obviously different from individual scientific genius or whatever. He just was able to construct the society where people got along. Um, all aspects of the society were controlled. So um, one thing that the book says was that grade school kids every morning, and this is what I used to do when we used to be in person. Uh, the day we did Confucius, everybody had to stand up and they had to bow to the teacher. And then they had to say, all human beings are by nature good. <laughs> so, you know, just think about how that could, that would be a powerful conditioner of human behavior if a little kid was taught that either human beings are by nature good or back in the Chow dynasty, 
the Chinese were great. And we're going to bring back that Chao dynasty and just constantly hitting a kid over the head with it. Um, so that was, that was his um, way of doing that. Now, this is the article for next time, so I'm not going to go through it. But I do want you to... Um, I do want you to wrap your mind around that, right? That our founders liked Confucius Analects and they wanted to start virtue clubs. Um, can you, do you guys have, I mean, why couldn't an American say, well, I go to church on Sunday. That's my virtue club. Why would our founders want Confucius Analects? I think because then you would actually have to apply those morals to your life instead of just like being in the presence of them for one day and then not paying attention to them after that. Also, this is humanism, right, Melanie? Yes. <laughs> I, I thought you'd say that, but yes, I think that's why you were ready to answer the question is because you can't use your religion. You can't hide behind a doctrine, right? Yes, I was very ready. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, because ah, if Confucius says it, it's, you know, that's what I used to ask the student the first day of class. If Jesus says the golden rule is true and Confucius says the golden rule is true, is it true if Jesus says it and false if Confucius says it? <laughs> And you know, the average college sophomore can't look you in the eye and say, only Jesus, <laughs> because you know, you're old enough to know that that's pretty stupid. Um, so so that's, what, that's what our founders wanted. They wanted us to make that mental leap that what's good about Christianity is what's in Confucius and anything else you cannot use as a weapon you know, to divide yourselves according to denomination or orthodoxy, right, Melanie? Does that make sense? Yes, that makes sense. So you think like a founder, Melanie, and you can tell your friends who think they're conservative that I'm the real conservative. <laughs> it's going to blow their mind, right? You can just blame me as long as they aren't coming to your graduation and I won't be there. <laughs> <laughs> okay, I will. Jack, what do you think of why the founders, does that make sense to you that they would want people to study Confucius Analects? Uh, you got to unmute. Yeah, I think what you were saying about like the, the kid that has to say has to bow to the teacher and say all human beings are good. Um, I think that would be good conditioning, but uh, I don't know if that was would be like, I don't know, it would have to be not something so, so so like a generalization like that. I don't know. I don't know if all human beings are good, but like <laughs> put that idea into your head. I, that's kind of like brainwashing to me. Well, yeah, I mean, it's, it's hard to distinguish between conditioning, right? Aristotle wanted children to be raised to take pleasure in doing noble acts, right? So you could say that that's what Confucius is up to. And then you would say, well, why didn't our founders want Aristotle? Well, that's because it would separate the Catholics from the Protestants. I mean, it would be divisive because different denominations valued Aristotle more. And so if you just take something that's way out there, nobody thought, nobody in America thinks Confucius is God. <laughs> so, okay, let's say, geez, he was humane, right? This is the real model. We want to dig out where's the humanity underneath all these labels now okay jack can you give an example of where a kid it would screw him up to say all humans are by nature good 
and an example of where it would be good for them? Um, I don't know. I think about like saying the pledge every day. <laughs> like, it's like, it's not a bad thing, but it's like, I don't know. It's like an indoctrination. Yeah, is, is there a difference? This is important, right? Um, because patriotism is just your brand, right? You don't have to be virtuous to be an American citizen. Does that make sense? And whereas all human beings are by nature good, seems to be more of a trying to, you know, you got to shape up. <laughs> but I'm thinking, well, the worst case scenarios are, I had some students once, their dad was a Baptist preacher and he abused them at home, right? So if you have kids that are conditioned to say that and then their parents are abusive or something, that would really mess up their minds. Does that make sense? Yeah. Is that, does that seem fair? Like an example of? Yes, ma'am. Yeah, okay. Um, what about you, Alex? Can you think of, what do you think of that, having a kid say that? Oh, well, um, I, uh, at first I thought like, yeah, like we, it would be really good to have the general idea that like, th that people are good and that we should all be good to each other. Um, but your example of the father abusing his children, um, eh, that you, you're right, that would mess up their minds because those kids would think like, oh, every, everyone is good. So what my dad is doing is good because he's a good man. So this is normal. And it would just create a little loop of them taking that possibly if they never learn that that is actually bad to other people in their lives as a as a way for them to show affection or or love um so it's so it's a, it's a hard hard thing to answer um, yeah it's and it's uh it's serious right a lot of parents will spank their kids because i love you you know and so then the psychologists come in there and say, no, this is not the way to do it. Um, but then you get people are anti-humanist, people who think people are by nature evil, that little kids need to be shaped up, right? Um, it doesn't work. It just leads to, you know, habitual violence. It makes kids afraid. People don't trust each other. So that is, we have a capacity for being trustworthy and for trusting people. We have a capacity for not being trustworthy and not trusting people. The trouble is we want to trust the people who are trustworthy and not trust the people who are not. <laughs> and kids, you know, can really get messed up if you get it, if you, you know, confuse those and call evil good and good evil. Okay, so here's Confucius' life. Um, I'm hoping you can compare this to Aristotle's virtues, right? He, um, he was a great teacher. I mean, he had self-control, um, courage, because he stood up to the political leaders and got himself in big trouble. He was generous. Um, he was even-tempered. He was uh, ambitious. He himself was poor, but he felt like he deserved to be able to talk to powerful or wealthy people and call them out. So that's appropriate ambition. He was had appropriate honor. He knew he was living honorably, even if he was dishonored. And his... Um, disciples or friends or whatever you want to call them, uh, recognized that he was an honorable man, even though he got mislabeled. 
He was a great teacher, just like Socrates, which I think is amazing. He understood the characters and he would ask them questions and uh, expose their character. He was humble about his abilities, which is self-knowledge. Remember that? You don't overestimate. You don't underestimate. Um, he, had, he had temperance, self-control. He had democratic instincts, right? So he was humanistic. Uh, he, could under, he could see the common humanity in all of us underneath all the affectations. He had a sense of mission. Uh, he made high demands on himself. And then he left. He wanted to go all around China and get these warring states, you know, get the, the heads of them to behave themselves and treat their citizens well and then negotiate with each other he wanted to get hired as a political advisor, but they didn't want to hear about it. He almost starved, right? He almost got starved out. And so he returned home, he edited the classics, and he died. Um, so uh, let me just stop for a sec. Does that remind you of Aristotle's virtues or Socrates or Jesus? Does that make sense to you guys? Starting to see patterns. What do you think we're going to find when we read about Buddha and Muhammad? It's not at all what you hear, right? Or what you think, what you grow up thinking. But it's basic humanity, right? Those basic virtues. They just keep coming up again. And they're respected over time. Like These are the people who become iconic. They become icons. Um, so there were the main concepts in uh, Confucianism is relationship. The word for human being is the same as the word for two. Um, so relating to other people and relating to yourself are inseparable. Um, learning without thinking leads to confusion. Thinking without learning is dangerous. Let me see. Let me, uh, I'll go to the other handout here. Um, okay. Let me go to the other handout that has some quotes. And next time, I will ask you which ones I, I, okay, if you have the book, I do have those page numbers and the number of the Analect and you can look those up. Um, otherwise you can just read from the book or the online version, just spend some time reading some Analects, pick your three favorite Analects and why you like them. And then I want you to create your own Analect right? Create three analects and explain why you created them. And the students really come up with really insightful things. So I do want you to all know that you have wisdom. Wisdom is not, you know, you don't want to worship Confucius. They don't want to be worshipped. They want you to realize you can get this this is um, deep inside, right? When you stop looking at all the superficial stuff and you go inside yourself, you can see which patterns are really harmful or really helpful. So this one is all about self-control, right? Sexuality. Um, and then also Confucius really focused on the relation between the generations and elder and younger, the five relationships. There's older sibling, younger sibling. There's husband and wife. There's ruler and ruled. There's, um, so those are all the, that's the cake of custom. That's what he wanted to weave everybody to do. Here's the golden rule. Okay, so I'm gonna page through a few of these 
And then I want you, I'm gonna stop and you tell me which one of these you liked the best and why, right? Um, and don't take the golden rule, that's too easy, unless you can think of some really good reason, right? He, in his personal conduct, he was serious in his duty, he was deferential in providing for the people he was beneficent, that means generous, and in directing them, he was just, that would mean he rules for the benefit of the ruled. What is wisdom? To devote yourself to your duty to humanity and respecting the spirits of the departed um, to avoid them. I mean, avoid getting their wrath, right? You wanna respect them. The man of virtue puts duty first. Suppose there were one who conferred benefits and who was able to succor the multitude. Um, must he not be a sage, right? The philanthropist is one who desiring to maintain himself sustains others. So there's no real difference between what I need and what you need. Um, all right, let me see. The mature adult. Oh, this is actually when I was in China, the, the big temples to Confucius always have him sitting with a book. He's the great educator. And I can tell you that if you want to go where there's no child left behind, it's China. Every Chinese kid has four grandparents that keep that kid on track because they only have one kid, right? And um, those kids are put through really rigorous educational process. And Confucius, you know, these statues of him, these sculptures of him with a book in his lap. The thing about Chinese education, it's pretty rote, right? It's pretty mindless. You memorize a bunch of stuff. Um, but I just, you know, America, I think we are just too arrogant. Like we were the great empire and we think we're gonna be able to stay that, but we don't educate our young people at all. We have a crappy educational system. How can we possibly compete in the future? And if we can't, then we're going to bomb people or feel threatened by them. I just, it doesn't, you know, we're not creating an atmosphere, a culture where we're likely to do well in the future because the future requires people trained in green energy, people trained in technology, people trained in all sorts of pretty sophisticated stuff. And yet our preschool K through 12 gets worse and worse. And people homeschool, right? As it gets worse, people take their kids out of the public school and it gets even worse. I mean, we're, we're in trouble. Um, but anyway, Confucius uh, acquiring knowledge, constantly, you know, exercising knowledge, learning more, um, is praised by Confucius. Um, he doesn't mind that he's dishonored, and Aristotle said that. Uh, people who really are honorable, they don't mind if they're not recognized because there's envy and people disagree. But those people always make sure that the people they think should be honored are honored because you want people to get in the habit of recognizing what's honorable. Then there's his view of an examined life, um, have a, being conscientious, uh, being insincere and practicing what you taught. A scholar who is not grave, so you have to be, there's a word in Greek, spudaios. Um, you, your learning has to be, you know, worth knowing. His chief principles, conscientiousness, sincerity, friendships are really important. Um, when in the wrong, amend that. Jesus said that too, right? If you have an argument with your brother, go and solve it. 
before you come to worship. Um, and then eating, right? Just basic temperance. Let me see. Why don't I just leave it there and ask you, was there one of those you liked, Jack? Yeah, the one about the, the honorable person not caring about being recognized. I think that's important. Um, like, um, that reminds me of like when people take videos of them giving something to a homeless person and then they'll put it on social media. Yeah. I mean, Jesus said not to do that, you know? Did you know that? There's a straight quote in the Bible. Yeah, wasn't there like a a Jewish, um, a rich Jewish person that would like give a lot of offering to the church so that he would be praised? I think, I think that was a... And there was a widow who gave two cents and he said, she's the one. Because she gave from her need, mm -hmm. not from her abundance. Yeah, and when you pray, pray in secret. And when you fast, keep it to yourself. And when you, yeah, I mean, it's common sense. Um, so that's, Confucius says the same thing. It's just, why do people keep making these mistakes? I, I don't know. Alex. Um, the rule that I liked was, well, it, it ties very closely to uh, my culture, especially, well, the um, respecting your elders. But the part of it that I don't like is like the like a power play um, between I don't know, like a boss and his workers. I like it. Yes, you're supposed to respect those who have like uh, experience over you or um, age, but it, it's frustrating when people. Um, misuse their the, the respect that is given to them um but i think i think it makes the world go around I, I i i get easily frustrated when people like my teammates they they this they disrespect our coach um and it just yeah it, it makes the world very upsetting <laughs> or like it, it just it's upsetting <laughs> Well, the issue is the coach isn't just always right or always wrong, but there's a basic uh, preferential option for just getting along for the sake of stability, right? And then it seems like if you have an issue, you could just talk to the coach about it and not gossip, right? Yes, we. it's, it's very equal where... Um... Of course, he is the one who leads us and whatnot. But if we do have issues, we are able to talk to him and he adjusts. And it's just the others who don't go about the right path. Passive aggressive or just, yeah, I don't know. I What I think is they must have learned that as children or something. You know what I mean? It must be a habit that they got into at some point. And they, I don't know if they even realize what they're doing or how toxic it is. Does that make sense, Alex? Yes, it makes sense. It's just hard because that's what I like about college. Like you get a second chance. You can re-examine everything. If you learn that at home, you're not at home anymore. <laughs> uh, anyway, Melanie, what about you? What one did you like? Um, it was under the mature adult. Um, he said he asks himself three questions and one of them was, am I being, or have I been insincere to my neighbor? Um, I just think that's important in keeping the peace in any society. You have to be able to receive other people's opinions, but also give yours and respect that in a mutual way. Okay. So another thing that's been true in America that makes it hard, and I mean, that makes this a difficult issue, is that respect for your elders keeps the cohesion going, but sometimes your elders abuse their power, right? 
I'm right because I'm older than you. I don't, you know, I don't have to be accountable for what I'm asking or how I'm living. And then the other thing is because of technology and science, the next generation knows stuff that the elders don't know. And so um, I remember being in an airplane once and the boss, like the guy that started the company was talking to an employee who knew the technology. <laughs> and so the employee is, is trying to tell his boss, you don't know what you're talking about, you know? And if the boss doesn't recognize that, I mean, this is the rapid change, right? That when things change really fast, technology changes really fast. Um, I think the older people just need to make good judgments about when to let the next generation run things, right? Or certainly when to defer to their authority. Um, because otherwise you're gonna get stuck in the past. Right now we're just stuck in the fossil fuel economy, which is a total <laughs> mistake. Like we, that's what powerful rich people know what to do when they don't wanna change things. Whereas the next generation could have a lot of ideas. It's just not listening because they don't want to get taken over, right? Um, does that make sense to you all that it's, you know, Confucius can go too far in terms of respect for your elders and get stuck in the past? I think he said something like um, the respect goes both ways. Like the older person should do things to be respected as well as so but. in theory it should work right mm. okay um at 15 here's a good one this is another thing that america with its focus on individual rights i have my right to this and my right to that it completely takes things away from how old you are and phases in life when you go through different stages in life. So this one's all about stages. And the wisdom literature is like that. So Jesus, for example, in his late 20s, or he was 30 when he had his conversion experience, and Confucius at a certain point turned around, right? And so at 15, at 30, and then the other thing that's interesting is that in America, a lot of people, especially men, but maybe women at this point, in their early 40s, they have a midlife crisis, right? And on this model, in when you're in your 40s, it starts coming together. So that was probably an indication that you didn't have your foundation established correctly, right? And so again, in college is when you should really think about this because you are basically on the 60 year plan and you have to think about you know, each decade or each five years, what do I want to accomplish? You know, So that as you get older, you know, it starts to weave into itself. Otherwise, one of the main midlife crises is that I just kept doing things other people wanted me to do. I never did what I really wanted to do. And then there's this explosion, right? Um, whereas if you set your mind on wisdom, right, if you set things right, then it will start coming together. Um, Shall I teach you the meaning of knowledge? This is so Socratic. When you know a thing to recognize, you know it. And when you don't, isn't that amazing? <laughs> That's Socrates all over again. It's important because arrogance is a social disease, right? It causes so many problems. Um, when nature, okay, again, I'm gonna ask you about this, so. When nature exceeds training, you have the rustic, right? That's somebody who isn't civilized enough 
when training exceeds nature, you have the clerk, right? And those are the ones that just nothing original. They just punch the buttons and do the numbers and have no creativity or passion. It's only when they're proportionate that you have the higher type of person. And then the golden mean, again, same old, same old with Aristotle, talented, yet seeking knowledge from the untalented, right? You seek knowledge from everybody. Um, you accomplish a lot, but you seek knowledge from people who only accomplish a few things. Um, and that's how to have a democracy. And it's interesting because the qualities for having a unified society are compatible with the qualities of democracy when it's at its best. Um, don't retaliate. Neither anxiety nor fear on searching within. So this is integration, right? Um, you integrate your emotions, your actions, your thoughts, the way you treat other people. Um, let's see, you're, you're a noble mind, you look for the good. If you're small minded, you just pick, pick on people. Um, your various duties at different stages of life. Um, all right, let's see. Yeah, we have four minutes. Uh, one more comment, and then we'll start next time with next time you pick your own. But what do you think, Jack? I think the first point about um, knowing or admitting when you don't know something is important because a lot of people want to pretend like they're experts on everything. And they it's kind of foolish to be like that. That's why one of Lyon's characteristics is intellectually honesty, intellectual honesty right um what about you alex oh whoops okay melanie did you see one you liked um the one that said what is knowledge i think it was the second point um like I see this within my own family, even where like, it's kind of like the world is changing and you can either decide if you want to change with it or you want to stay where you are. And some of my family, um, they choose to kind of stay with their beliefs of like the older days um, and not really grow with the world and change their beliefs. The thing that interests me, Melanie, is our founders were not like that, right? They were radical progressive. And so I would say two thirds or three quarters of Americans in the way they think, they would have been redcoats. <laughs> they wouldn't have wanted to break from Britain, right? And they would have yeah. <laughs> They would have thought of us as traitors, right? What's wrong with divine right of kings? You know, I don't want separation of church and state. I don't want science, you know? I mean, what made us great was we loved science. That's what made us great. I, now we're gonna make America great again by loving religion. And that's what made, that's what the, we were getting away from. Um, I don't know, I kind of make your day. Does that make you happy, God? <laughs> Isn't that ironic, Jack? Yeah. What was the question? Well, I mean, we are three quarters of Americans would have sided with the British. Oh, yeah. The ones that call themselves patriots no like lack the lack of critical thinking just staying along party lines just listening to what the authorities say they're just thinking tradition is good because it's true i mean our founders were so radical they completely shifted the worldview and they got demonized for it you know 
Um, so it is scary that two thirds, at least of Americans would not agree with our founders. <laughs> But that was what made us great, was we were going to start over, we we're going to get over all those old habits of worshiping the king, of using your religion to, as a political weapon, of ignoring science. Science was going to save us. We're going to have a science of politics. We're going to have social science to figure out how to condition kids. Oh, boy, you guys, you got a mess on your hands. <laughs> You got to govern this society. So at least I'm going to give you some stuff, some tools. I bet Melanie likes Confucius because it's so humanistic. Is that right, Melanie? I do. He might be my new favorite. Okay. <laughs> That's great. I It's exciting because I think, I think Melanie's going to really like this. And that's why, you know, once I have students for one or two classes, once it starts to build, then you can have a whole intellectual history together. And that's what I like about mine. You can just then, you know, Jack or Melanie, I'll go, oh, remember three years ago when we talked about blah, blah? <laughs> and they go, oh, I don't know. Dr. Beck, you remember that? Yeah, I tried to. Okay, we'll see you. Bye, Dr. Beck. Bye-bye.